I've always been fascinated by musical instruments, but growing up, I never thought that I would be designing them myself. I didn't start figuring that out until around 2003 when I moved to Montreal. And a friend suggested that I sit in on a graduate seminar at McGill University. This friend co-taught the seminar, so I found myself sitting in on a class taught by three different professors. One was a composer, one my friend a percussionist, and the third was a professor of music technology, what McGill calls music technology. Now, the idea of this class was that all the students would form small groups. Each group would have at least one composer, some performers, and music technology students. And in the course of a single semester, this group would conceive of a brand new musical instrument, design that instrument, build it, write a piece for it, learn how to play that piece, and then by the end of the semester, they would perform it in a recital. My role in my group was to compose a piece for two performers, each of whom was wearing a pair of gloves that was covered in sensors. So the idea is instead of plucking a string or maybe bowing it or blowing into an instrument, instead they would control their instrument with the pressure of a fingertip, the bend of a finger, or maybe the angle of their hand. We also decided to mount a camera to one of the performer's faces, and I wrote some software that would extract the shape of their mouth. Now this is an excerpt from part of the score for this piece, and this is definitely the first time that I had a chance to use the instruction, use tongue delay in a musical score. And I might add that this is something that the performer discovered themselves by sticking out their tongue when there was a camera pointing at it. Now, for me, this was more like it. This was fascinating. This was much better than my previous musical education, so I immediately threw away all my old plans and made new plans. This was pretty easy because I didn't actually have any plans at the time. So quickly as I could, I enrolled in the graduate program at McGill University, and over the next many, many years, I had the chance to design a number of musical instruments. So I'd like to share some of the, the process and the story that went into a couple of these instruments so you can understand where they came from and maybe a little bit more about this field of research. Composing for the gloves was extremely interesting. This was crazy for me, but it was also very frustrating. They were incredibly difficult for the performers to play, and then that made the composer's job very hard because I had to try to find things that were realistically achievable by these performers, especially when they only had one semester to learn how to play them. Now, we know that humans have incredible facility with our hands. We're very, very good at controlling our hands. But we're actually not so good at controlling them in space without any resistance. What we're best at is manipulating things. When there's something pushing back when I'm holding an object, then I can really control things with great precision and also get really great feedback from the sensors in my skin. For our next project, we decided instead of putting sensors on the body, we'd really go back to something that was an object. So we started this project called the T-Stick with my collaborator, who was a composer named D. Andrew Stewart. And we decided we had a few interesting concepts that we would really try to push with this instrument. First of all, we would try to make it ridiculously strong. That was going to be our number one priority. Rather than being cool, this one wasn't going to break. <laughs> this is important because usually handmade prototypes tend to be a little bit fragile, and that's okay. This is still super interesting. But in past projects, we'd noticed that if the performers couldn't really spend lots and lots and lots of quality time with the instrument, then they would never really be able to accept it as something that was maybe comparable to a traditional instrument, where they could really sort of give themselves to it. I wanted this one to be so strong, I wasn't even going to be present during any of the rehearsals. This was my idea. I was going to build the instrument, give it to them, and then walk away. I knew that if I was there, I'd be leaning over their shoulder and going, uh, you know, uh, it's, not, it's not really supposed to do that. Can you, okay, to stop. Like, you know, I thought it would actually be better if they could explore it fully, freely, and then if it was going to break, they can bring it to me, say sorry, and I'll fix it. We were going to build an object. Let's just make something really abstract, something that's geometrically simple that doesn't suggest an existing instrument, so it doesn't look like a guitar. No one's going to know how to play it when they first get it. And then that means we're basically just going to have to sense everything, because we don't know what people are going to do with this. As an interesting note, if I have a violin, everyone knows how to play a violin, right? So if I pluck the string, it makes a sound. If I bow the string, it makes a sound. But what happens if I whip it around my head or if I drop it on the floor? It still makes sound. These aren't accepted performance techniques. Please don't do this with your friend's violin. <laughs> but we do run the risk when we design a digital instrument, I might know how to play it and only ever enable one way of really accessing any expression from this instrument. So I think it's much more interesting if we sort of sense things more holistically, 
and connect those to musical variables that people can control and then see what the performers do with it. Finally, we had this great idea. We were going to build a family of instruments. Instead of just building one, let's build a consort of them, like a string quartet. We had a few interesting reasons for this. One was to look at transport transportability of skills. So if I learn how to play one of them, it, maybe I am a little bit better at learning to play one of the bigger ones. Another one, we have this incredible problem with a brand new instrument. If you go to a concert and you see a new instrument played, you have no context. You've never seen this instrument before. You don't know what it can do. You don't know what the performer can do. You don't know the piece. Basically, everything's blank. We had this idea that if we put several performers on stage, this can kind of parallelize your process of getting context about the instrument. So it turns out you can see that the second performer from the left is actually just a terrible musician, and it's not that the instrument is bad at all. We decided to go with a tube as the shape, and we packed all these electronics into a piece of plumbing pipe that I cut in half, coated it in rubber shrink tubing to make it sweat-proof and waterproof, well, mostly waterproof, and quite strong. And the musicians didn't manage to break it too many times. We used sensors that were designed really for microwave oven uh, control panels, but overclocked so that they would be much more responsive. We made custom pressure sensors out of conductive paper, put in inertial sensors that would sense movement and orientation, and also a contact microphone that would, was designed to sense tapping. That's why I put it in there, but the musicians quickly figured out that it also would sense twisting if they twisted the pipe. All of the sensor data is gathered up, but most of it needs to be massaged a bit. From the orientation and movement data, we can extract things like jabbing, sweeping, swinging the instrument, things that are really maybe descriptions of gesture instead of sensor data. From the touch data, we don't just get touch and release, we also get gripping, cradling, hugging, we can get brushing, things like this. And finally, we need to write a lot of software, not just to do this uh, data processing that I was talking about, but also to synthesize sound, and then, importantly, to support the process of linking the gestures to the sound. This is by far the hardest part of designing a new musical instrument. Sensors are easy, objects are easy, Synthesizers are pretty easy, but how do you connect them? What is this gesture going to do? And here's a happy family of T-sticks. The first real performance on the T-stick took place in the fall of 2006, when Brazilian percussionist Fernando Rocha played it in as one of the pieces on his doctoral lecture recital. So this means his performance was really graded. Here's a little piece of it. Over the years, our programming got a little bit better. We figured out some things a little more nuanced, but more importantly, we started to develop a sort of gestural vocabulary for the instruments. It was really about a performance technique. In this case, this is the composer, Andrew Stewart, playing, and everything he's doing, he's continuously controlling the sound using where his fingers are placed, the pressure, orientation, movement, Since then, we've had the opportunity to share this instrument, the T-Stick, sort of with a wide audience around the world. It's been to some tech conventions like Wired NextFest, to international conferences for demos and workshops, uh, new music festivals, but most importantly, dozens and dozens and dozens of performances, real concert performances. And this is where, we're, where we have a chance to learn and improve the instrument. In 2010, we launched the T-Stick Composition Workshops, where Andrew managed to recruit five more composers to write pieces for the instrument. And also in 2010, five of these T-Sticks were played by blind performers as part of a large performance in Porto, in Portugal. Back in 2008, we did a very brief little collaboration with a choreographer and a composer, where I designed a special T-Stick, especially for a dancer. This one was wireless, so the dancer could really explore the space. It could detect the direction that it was pointing, so we could use it to control the spatialization of sound, and also it was much stronger so that the dancer could lean on it. A couple years after that, the same collaborators got together to try to do a, a longer project where we could have a bit more time to work with 
making instruments for dancers. This time, we would take the T-stick and extend the shape. We were going to lose this boring old cylinder, the abstract shape that we liked so much before, really try to extrapolate into new forms. We were going to design, design specifically for dancers, and also we were going to explore wearable instruments. Now, I'm not talking about wearable sensors. This is different from the gloves that I was so frustrated with earlier. I'm not talking about putting a sensor on a dancer's arm. I'm talking about putting another arm on the dancer. Really talking about making metaphorical prostheses, things that would attach the dancer and make them move in a way that they would never move normally. The dancer becomes part of the instrument. By allowing the dancer to remove the instrument and place it on themselves smoothly, gracefully, as part of the performance, we thought also we could blur a perception between what's the dancer's body and what's an object, even during a single performance. And finally, we would have time to use intensive workshops to really iterate and go through this process to design, to build, to try things out, to revise them, and then start again. We built two different kinds of instruments. The first we called the rib and the visor. The T-stick now became sort of a shell around the body of the dancer. We used laser cutters and 3D printers, digital fabrication techniques, to enable us to quickly tweak a design and then create a new version to try it with the dancers. The final versions are made from a solvent-welded sandwich of acrylic plastic and polycarbonate. We extended the T-stick capacitive touch sensing so that it worked with transparent materials. Each of these instruments also tracks its orientation in space and movement. They can be usable as handheld instruments or merged with the dancer's body by being attached to their costume, at which point perhaps the dancer themselves is an instrument playable by another performer. The other instrument that we developed, we call the spine. This time we kept the tubular nature of the T-stick, but decided to make it deformable, so we could twist it and bend it and shape it and attach it to the back of the dancer as a sort of second backbone. We started with packing foam and a lot of Velcro, stuck things to the dancers, looked at how they moved, did some more sketching, and revised. And I started to become fascinated with the space between the two spines of the dancer, between their own back and this instrument that we were attaching to them. When the dancer bent forward, our instrument would hug their back, but when they bent backwards, it would sprout out from their head like this sort of magical thing. And I decided that we really had to sense this change in shape. So we figured out how to use some uh, inertial and magnetic sensors to sense not just orientation of the instrument, but also deformation, the shape of it. So we're sensing twist, bending, freely in space, This is one of, just one of the foam instruments before we even moved on to the, the good ones. Remember I said we wanted to use iterative design. Well, during the process of this project, we designed many, many, many versions of the T-stick, or not the T-stick, the spine. We started with the T-stick and then did different designs exploring materials, size, shape, sensing, how to attach it to the dancers so that they could remove it and add it freely themselves. You can see there's a lot of dead ends in this map, but this is important. This is how we got to the finished version, which looks like this. The final version of the spine uses laser-cut acrylic as vertebra on rails of PVC plastic. It's deformable, it tracks its shape and its orientation in space. The piece Le Geste toured parts of Canada and Europe in the spring of 2013. You can see we had to make quite a few of these instruments, not just our development prototypes, but also instruments for rehearsal, a full set of instruments to go on tour and a backup set of instruments since we knew that in a foreign city, no one was going to be able to go to a luthier and say, I need spare parts for my digital spine. Now, people often send me emails asking whether the designs for these instruments are open source, whether this is something that we share whether they can maybe download some plans or circuit diagrams or some code. 
Now, the answer to this is generally yes, of course. But I have a challenge for them. These are instruments that I built because of specific questions that I had, interesting concepts, I, concepts that I found interesting. For, at a certain time, I thought it would be interesting to look at a, designing an instrument from a certain perspective. So why don't you design the instruments that are conceived in your own head, and we'll just try and support that with tools for designing instruments. So a large part of my research is actually designing tools for the design of new digital musical instruments. Now, where might you start if you, have a, if you want to have an idea for an instrument? Well, in my opinion, inspiration is everywhere, and there's no right place to start. You might be inspired by a specific sound, some sort of musical process. Could be an output media. It doesn't have to be music. Maybe it's video. Maybe it's controlling a robot. Maybe you like a specific algorithm or a model. Maybe a gesture or a posture or an activity, like making tea or playing chess or dancing. Maybe there's a sensor that you really think is exciting that just came out. A tool, an object, or an environment, a venue that you're particularly inspired by that you think would be <laughs> by some sort of interactive musical feedback. Inspiration for these things can be found everywhere. <laughs>